Hello everyone, in this lecture podcast, I will be discussing the uh, week 10 topic on judicial review remedies. It's obviously crucial that we talk about judicial review remedies because as far as uh, administrative law is concerned and the need, for example, to have recourse to the courts for administrative decisions which an applicant may find to be uh, contrary to law, it is not sufficient that we can assume that a court will have jurisdiction over an application. It might be that the court does have jurisdiction over an application. It might also be true that an applicant actually has legal standing to file the application. It might also be true that the applicant will have grounds for judicial review. But ultimately, the applicant is filing an application for judicial review because he wants something to happen. He wants a remedy. So even if, for example, there has been a decision by an administrative body or agency that is contrary to law, it is important, as far as the applicant is concerned, that there is redress uh, in relation to that unlawful uh, administrative decision. And therefore, it brings us to the idea that judicial review remedies must be available. We need to remember, as we will see later on, uh, the case of Green versus Daniels, where Justice Stephen, Justice Stephens at the High Court pointed out that even if a court were inclined in a proper case to actually intervene and undertake a process of judicial review, it may not be possible uh, for the court to provide the appropriate remedy that the applicant wants. In that specific case, for example, as we will see later on, the uh, Justice Stephens at the High Court pointed out that although uh, he felt that the administrative decision maker had been had made a mistake in uh, coming up with a regulation that seemed to be contrary to law. Still, the court, acting uh, as a court of limited uh, resort, was not in a position to provide the remedy sought by the applicant, which in that case was for benefits uh, to be paid out uh, to the applicant. So. It is important, therefore, that when we examine uh, judicial review, we don't just look at whether or not uh, the court has jurisdiction, whether or not a, a decision might involve, an admissive decision might involve uh, something that is contrary to law, that is unlawful, or whether or not the applicant has standing to file the case, and whether or not there actually need sufficient legal grounds for the application for judicial review. Uh, it is important that we also determine whether or not appropriate judicial, judicial remedies are available because otherwise an application will be ineffectual and uh, of, of little use. If uh, it turns out that uh, the applicant will not be able to gain the kind of redress that he or she would seek to, to, to acquire. So that is the uh, purpose of this lecture podcast. We focus this time on uh, judicial review remedies. So after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the distinction between common law prerogative judicial remedies and equitable judicial rev review remedies. And of course, uh, you can contrast this with uh, statutory judicial review remedies. As well, uh, after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the specific common law our prerogative judicial remedies of certiorari, mandamus, prohibition, and habeas corpus. Should also be able to discuss and explain the specific equitable judicial remedies of declaration and injunction and the statutory judicial review remedies. Now, there are actually three types of judicial review uh, remedies available in a judicial review of administrative decisions and actions. First of all is common law, prerogative writs of certiorari, prohibition, mandamus, and habeas corpus. The second would be the equitable remedies of declaration and injunction. And thirdly, would be the statutory remedies available under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 Commonwealth, as well as Section 39B of the Judiciary Act of 1903. Uh, I, I, I'll provide a, a short background first on, on these three. Uh, types of judicial re review remedies and then point out as well that there is in fact a, a, a constitutional writ based on section 75.5 the Australian Cons common law constitution 
which uh, grants to the High Court the power to issue writs of mandamus, prohibition, and injunction uh, in relation to officers of the Commonwealth. Now, what exactly is the distinction between uh, common law and the equitable remedies that we speak of? It's important that we go back to uh, some history uh, of the legal system of the UK from which uh, the Australian legal system has borrowed heavily. And we begin with the idea that in ancient England, courts have uh, always asserted their right to control or regulate the exercise of uh, powers of the executive, mainly the power actually of the king. And if you look at the history of the UK, therefore, you will see a constant struggle between the courts of England as well as the king uh, of, the, of, of, of England. And of course, there has, also been a, there has also been a struggle between the king as well as uh, the parliament of the UK. Now, what we need to remember is that uh, there was a point where the, the, the king of England was considered an absolute uh, monarch, so much so that it was the belief of uh, the king of the UK, for example, that he was the uh, representative of uh, God on earth. And this is what, for example, may be referred to as the divine right of kings where, for example, uh, King James I in 1610, uh, in a speech, pointed out that the monarch's place uh, was actually uh, at the top in terms of the natural order. And so he asserted, for example, that not only God's lieutenants upon earth uh, and sit upon God's throne, but even by God himself, they are called gods. And so uh, there had always been an assertion by the king uh, the, of you know of having an absolute uh, right to rule, and therefore it was initially the assertion of the king that courts could not uh, control the exercise of his power. But there had been a a, uh, a struggle with the courts, which we consider to be common law courts, uh, um, and the, the courts had prevailed after uh, some of the struggle, so that. It has now it had now become legally accepted after a while that courts do uh, common law courts do have uh, the power to control the excesses or the exercise of government uh, of the king's power or the executive's power, especially as far as they would interfere with the rights, freedoms, or liberties of of the people. Now. Why were they called common law in the first place? So they're considered common law because there had been an attempt on the part of courts, for example, to try to develop a law that was common across England. And so that's the reason why it's a common law. And the, the, the attempt at developing a common law in England is really based on the assumption that it was better to come up with a unified system of law among the courts. And for that reason, we have the idea of stare decisis and judicial precedents where uh, courts in a certain jurisdiction are bound by judicial precedents. So you end up therefore with a common law. And so uh, as, I, as I pointed out, as far as the uh, common law is concerned, it is an attempt on the part of the courts to restrain or control the actions or decisions of the executive as far as they would interfere with the rights and freedoms of the people through the issuance of writs of certiorari, prohibition mandamus, and habeas corpus. Now they considered prerogative because uh, the courts, the common law courts, had the discretion to grant the writ or not in an appropriate case. Now, crucially, what we need to remember, and this is why this is different from equitable remedies, is that as far as the discretion of the, of the common law courts to um, issue writs of certiorari, prohibition, mandamus, and habeas corpus, uh, they would only issue this if, as we will see later on, as I discuss later on more, more uh, thoroughly, they would only issue these writs if certain elements are met. And these elements were quite rigid, so that if an element was not met, for example, um, if it could be shown that a person who applied to the court for the issuance, for example, of a certiorari uh, did not have uh, a legal right 
or did not have a right that was being violated, then the court cannot issue, for example, certiorari prohibition mandamus or habeas corpus. Or the other thing was, um, common law courts were not in a position to order specific performance. So therefore, there were constraints on uh, as far as uh, remedies that were uh, granted by the common law courts were concerned. And so therefore, there was an attempt later on uh, of litigants, given the fact that they could not always uh, get the, the kind of remedy that they sought from the common law courts, they would actually address their concerns to, to the king. Uh, through the Court of Chancery, for example, which became the Court of Equity in the sense that if they could not find redress because of the rigid uh, requirements of the common law courts, then they could make a plea uh, to the king or to the, to, the, uh, to the Lord Chancellor, who was the representative of the king. And the advantage of going, making a plea before the king is that the king, or at least his representative, was in a position to fashion a remedy that would suit the requirements of a specific applicant or litigant. So which mean, meant, therefore, that um, a, a court, the court of chancery, for example, could issue injunctions or could issue declarations or even could, could, or, could order a specific performance on the part of another person. So the equitable remedy, therefore, which originally started as a, an offshoot of an exercise of the king's power to remedy the, rigid, the rigidity of the common law writs, uh, which came from the courts. Uh, the equitable remedies, as I pointed out, uh, were, were, were in a sense preferable because they could be fashioned to the specific requirements of an applicant or litigant. And more importantly, even if certain elements uh, may not be present, which would have prevented a court from issuing a common law writ, it was still possible uh, for the uh, courts of chancery to, to grant equitable remedies. So therefore, the, <clears throat> the equitable remedies not only were uh, uh, were, were susceptible to being fashioned according to the needs of, of, of a litigant, but they were uh, crucial because if a common law court, for example, could not issue a writ because of its rigidity, of the rigidity of its rules, it was possible uh, for, the court, uh, for the court of chancery to be able to uh, disregard or to even forego or waive some of these requirements. Now, we will, of course, know, uh, especially in Australia and even in the UK, that at some point, although at one point there, was, uh, there, was, there were common law courts which existed, which were separate from the king, and then there was a court of chancery, which in a sense was actually part of the king's bench or part of the, uh, the structure that was within the, 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 the sovereign king, so you have the Court of Chancery, which existed separate from the common law courts. At some point, these two had merged. So that the Court of Chancery was disbanded. And what you then had have was a, a common law court, which was not under the directly under the king's control. But at the same time, because of the fusion of the common law courts and the courts of chancery, you now had a common law court that was also able to grant equitable remedies apart from the traditional common law prerogative writs of certiorari, prohibition, mandamus, and habeas corpus. Now, in addition, the reason why I kind of delayed the discussion about the statutory remedies is because, as uh, pointed out, so we'll see later on, as pointed out by both the federal court and the high court, even as far as the statutory remedies available under, under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 Commonwealth, uh, the fact alone that this statute exists and is in place did not mean that the courts uh, no longer were in a position to grant common law writs as well as equitable remedies. So therefore, both the federal court and the high court have, have ruled that even if an applicant would seek 
uh, remedies under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977, the power of the courts should be interpreted broadly to mean that courts can continue to uh, grant uh, common law prerogative writs of certiorari, prohibition, mandamus, and habeas corpus, as well as the equitable remedies of declaration and injunction. Now, that is a crucial point because uh, what it certainly means is that because you have the Administrative Decision Judicial Review Act of 1977, which is actually an act of parliament, it would then mean that it is also within the power of the, of the parliament to amend the law or even, or even uh, to find a way that uh, not only that the law is uh, amended, but to actually repeal the law because it is a parliamentary enactment. It is a statute that was passed by parliament. Now, it bears repeating that even if the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act were somehow to be repealed by, uh, by the Common of Parliament, what we need to remember is that the common law prerogative writs and the equitable remedies that belong to the courts will remain because that is based on the historic and traditional assertion of the courts that they have the power to control uh, government action that may interfere with the rights and freedoms of the people. Now, we will go into detail, obviously, uh, as to the statutory remedies available under the Administrative Judicial Review Act of 1977, but it is also uh, worth repeating at this point, or stating at this point, that um, the writs of mandamus, prohibition, and injunction are available also to the federal court under the Judiciary Act of, of 1903, Commonwealth, or Section under Section 39B, which, as you will see later on, is actually a similar provision to that uh, as found in Section 755 of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, which states that uh, the High Court has the original jurisdiction uh, in all matters where writs of prohibition, mandamus, or injunction are sought against officers of the Commonwealth. So the Judiciary Act of 1903, Section 13 and B, refers to the power of the uh, federal court to issue writs of mandamus, prohibition, and injunction. And um, as far as Section 75.5, the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, it refers to the power of the High Court to issue the same writs in relation to officers of the Commonwealth. Now, let's go deeper now into the... Uh, into the uh, common law uh, remedies. So we have common law judicial remedies such as certiorari, prohibition, mandamus, and here prius corpus, and they are considered uh, prerogative writs because of, as I pointed out, because of their discretionary nature, discretionary nature, and their purpose in safeguarding the crown and its prerogatives against legal noncompliance. And as part of the common law, the circumstances under which prerogative writs may be uh, Granted, as I pointed out, are based on judicial precedents because, remember, the development of the common law uh, was actually an attempt on the part of the courts to come up with a common or unified system of law in the UK or in England. Uh, and that can only be done through the, uh, through the principle of stare decisis or judicial precedents. But because of the need for a unified system of law, it also means that courts should attempt and following stare decisis, courts should attempt to fashion uh, justice in a similar way so that therefore there was a rigidity uh, as far as the issuance of common law judicial remedies were concerned. And so uh, there, there were rigid requirements, as we will see later on, uh, that had to be met before a common law judicial writ could be issued. And more importantly, it was always subject to the discretion of the court. Now, as I pointed out, uh, the equitable remedies emerged uh, as a way of uh, the Court of Chancery, which was part of the King's Bench, uh, to remedy the technicalities and limitations of common law judicial remedies, which at some point had been considered to be quite rigid. And so that if a, as I pointed out, if a litigant or an applicant did not meet certain requirements, then common law judicial uh, writs would not be available to that particular litigant. So uh, the courts of chancery 
uh, came up with equitable judicial remedies of declaration and injunction, as well as specific performance, actually, uh, which meant that courts of chancery at some point could then fashion uh, these writs to meet the specific needs of an applicant. And so it, what this also meant was that even if um, certain requirements that were needed to be shown before a common law court could issue a writ, uh, even if you know, certain requirements were not met, uh, the courts of chancery were in a position to disregard them, if need be, in order to, to meet justice in a specific case. And uh, as, as I pointed out, it is crucial to remember that uh, at some point, both in the, uh, especially in the UK, there had been a merger of the courts of chancery and uh, the common law courts, so that at some point, the common law courts were now courts both of the common law as well as courts of equity. And that is true as well in Australia, so that an Australian court is both a common law court as well as a court of equity. So therefore, a, common law, a court in Australia, for example, is both able to dispense uh, common law uh, writs uh, uh, as well as equitable writs. Now, let's talk about statutory remedies. So as far as the statutory remedies are concerned, which we will discuss in detail in a, uh, in a short while, uh, it bears, uh, again, just repeating that there are two statutes that uh, provide for the uh, statutory remedies. These are this was initially based on Section 39B of the Judiciary Act of 1903, Commonwealth, which I pointed out, uh, provides the uh, Federal Court of Australia the power to issue writs of mandamus, prohibition, and injunction uh, against officers of the Commonwealth. And then we have the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977, Commonwealth, which uh, provides several uh, judicial review remedies uh, both to the Federal Circuit Court of Australia as well as the Federal Court of Australia. We're going to discuss the, uh, the specific uh, judicial review remedies in a short while as I point out to you that a lot of these uh, statutory judicial review remedies are actually uh, of the same character as both the common law and equitable remedies. Uh, we're going to get that to that in a short while. Now, again, it bears repeating that um, Section 13 b of the Judiciary Act of 1903 uh, is actually a provision that is patterned after Section 75, subparagraph 5 of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, which uh, provides for the original jurisdiction of the High Court to issue writs of mandamus, prohibition, and injunction in relation to officers of the Commonwealth. Now, it is important to emphasize that that writ is actually a constitutional writ. So what it means is, be, is that because it is a writ that is uh, provided by the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, it is not within the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to change the original, the original jurisdiction of the High Court. Whereas the Judiciary Act of 1903 and the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977, because these are statutory creations of the Commonwealth Parliament, it is within the power of the Commonwealth Parliament either one to amend or change uh, these laws or to even repeal them, but not in relation to the constitutional writ because it is a provision uh, based or founded upon the Australian Commonwealth Constitution which the Commonwealth Parliament, therefore, because of the separation of powers, is not uh, in a position to change. We're going to discuss these statutory remedies in greater detail in a short while. Now, let me just discuss a bit about jurisdictional error because this is a, a, uh, a legal uh, a uh, legal term that will appear repeatedly in the course of this of this lecture podcast. So, uh, in Craig versus South Australia, Justice Brennan had had defined uh, jurisdictional error as happening when a court, for example, mistakenly asserts or denies the existence of jurisdiction. So, when a, a an inferior court, and by by extension later on, when an administrative agency mistakenly asserts 
ordinates the existence of jurisdiction, that would amount to jurisdictional error. Or if a, an inferior court or by extension an administrative agency misapprehends or disregards the nature or limits of its functions or powers, in a case where it correctly recognizes that jurisdiction does exist, that would also amount to uh, jurisdictional error. So even if, even for example, if a court actually is a court or an, an administrative body is actually correct in saying that it does have uh, the jurisdiction over a case, but when that court or administrative agency misapprehends or disregards the nature or limits of its functions or powers, there would still be jurisdictional error. Now, so again, what does jurisdiction mean? Jurisdiction actually refers to the power of the court or an administrative agency to decide a particular case. So that refers to the power to decide or to determine a particular case or a particular matter. Now, jurisdictional error, jurisdictional error is at its most obvious where the inferior court purports to act wholly or partly outside the general area of its jurisdiction in the sense of entertaining a matter or making a decision or order of a kind which wholly or partly lies outside the theoretical limits of its functions and powers. Now, how do we distinguish jurisdictional error from an error of law? We need to remember that every jurisdictional error is always involves an error of law because if there is a jurisdictional error, it necessarily means that there has been an error of law. However, not every error of law involves a jurisdictional error because you can have uh, an error of law such as, uh, for example, because there has been a misinterpretation of the law or because there has been a, um, a denial, for example, of procedural uh, justice or the right to natural justice or procedural fairness. Now, that, that may constitute an error of law, but it does not get into the idea of jurisdictional error because, as we said, it's possible that a court actually has jurisdiction. So in which case, there is no jurisdictional error, but when a court exercises its jurisdiction and comes up with and arrives at a decision, it may commit an error of law. So uh, to repeat, every jurisdictional error always involves an error of law, of law, but not every error of law involves a jurisdictional error. So let's look at uh, the first uh, of the usual common law remedies, which is certiorari. So certiorari is a writ that is issued by a superior court quashing or nullifying an order or decision of an inferior court or tribunal on the ground of jurisdictional error, breach of natural justice or procedural fairness, fraud or error of law on the face of the record. So these are the grounds when uh, a superior court may issue uh, a writ of uh, certiorari, which is a uh, common law uh, judicial review remedy. Now, the function of certiorari is to quash the legal effect of the legal consequences of the decision or order under review. So that by quashing the legal effect of, or, of the legal consequences of the decision or order or, or under review, it means therefore that there is no decision or order in the first place that, that could then be implemented against an applicant. So that is the effect of a quashal of a decision. As a result of uh, the common remedy of the writ of certiorari. Now, however, because uh, this is a common law remedy, there is a requirement that certiorari can only issue when a decision or order has an effect upon rights. So its function is to quash the legal effect of the legal consequences of the decision or order under review. So that if there is a decision or order that might be issued by a court or an administrative body or an administrative tribunal, but it has no effect upon rights, then in that case, as pointed out by the High Court in Ainsworth versus Criminal Justice Commission, certiorari cannot issue. So for example, in the case of Ainsworth versus Criminal Justice Commission, uh, there had been a report 
that had been published that was um, detrimental to the reputation or prejudicial to the reputation of the applicant. But even if there was a, a report that was uh, detrimental or prejudicial to the reputation of the, of the applicant, the High Court found that such a report did not actually uh, affect the, the power of the, the court or, or the power of the administrative body in that particular case to issue a ruling uh, based on the report because at the end of the day, it was still going to be within the power of the, the administrative body to, regard, to disregard uh, the report. So therefore, in that case, because it was just a mere report, it had no effect upon the rights of the, of the applicant. And so therefore, certiorari was not a, a proper writ to be issued. Now, there's also a distinction, which is crucial to me, between uh, uh, in terms of what evidence or record can be reviewed when certiorari is sought. So when certiorari is sought on the ground of jurisdictional error, breach of procedural fairness or fraud, the court entertaining an application for certiorari can, subject, subject to applicable procedural and evidentiary rules, take account of any relevant material placed before it. So it is not, so in that case, when the allegation uh, or uh, for the application for judicial review is based on the ground of jurisdictional error, breach of procedural justice, or procedural fairness, or fraud, the court is not limited to what appears on the face of the record, but it can take account of any relevant material placed before it. However, when relief is sought on the ground of error of law on the face of the record, the superior court is restricted to the record of the inferior court or tribunal, and the writ will enable the quashing of the imputed order or decision only on the ground that it is affected by some error of law which is disclosed uh, by that record. So it will ordinarily include nothing more than the documentation which in initiates the proceedings and thereby grounds the jurisdiction of the tribunal, the pleadings, if any, and the adjudic adjudication. So for example, in, uh, in the case of uh, Craig versus uh, South Australia, a ruling of the High Court in relation to Craig uh, was not evident in, uh, in the, uh, on the face of the record. And because it was not evident on the face of the record, even if the, there was an assertion that the decision made by the inferior court was uh, involved an error of law, because the, because the, um, the reasoning of the inferior court was not evident on the face of the record. There was nothing therefore for the superior court to review. And for this reason, uh, the, the writ of certiorari could not be issued by the superior court. Now, what is prohibition? Prohibition as another common law uh, judicial re re uh, remedy is a writ which is issued by a court to restrain an inferior court or a decision maker from exceeding its powers or acting outside of or beyond its jurisdiction. Uh, it is also a writ that is issued to restrain an inferior court or a decision maker from, from undertaking a further and lawful action or from exercising its power. The writ is available also on the ground of want or excess of jurisdiction, breach of natural justice or fraud. But again, as pointed out, this is a discretionary remedy. Um, in Re Refugee Review Tribunal ex parte ELA, Chief Justice Gleason cited two instances when prohibition may be refused, because remember, this is a discretionary uh, remedy. The first is that if the administrative structure incorporates provisions for an internal appeal. So if there is an internal a mechanism for an internal appeal, uh, the, the writ of prohibition may be denied by the, by, by the court. Or two, e even if there is a claim that there was a denial of procedural fairness, which would then require 
the intervention of the court by uh, the issuance of a writ of prohibition, where that denial of procedural fairness had been uh, had been redressed or addressed because the applicant was then able to successfully have an appeal and have a full and fair hearing on that appeal, then in that case, uh, the writ of prohibition would also be uh, would also be denied. So as pointed out by just Chief Justice Mason in R versus Mark, Marx, ex parte Australian Building Construction Employees Builders Laborers Federation, uh, prohibition to the first decision maker may be refused on the footing that any denial of natural justice at that level has become irrelevant. So that in that case, I would have been um, the denial of procedural justice or natural justice would have become irrelevant if the applicant was already given an opportunity to be heard. Therefore, um, rectifying or, or, or providing a remedy to the initial uh, problem of a denial of natural justice. In Re-Refugee Review Tribunal, uh, ex parte ELA, the High Court pointed out that there are at least four requirements that must be met for uh, the writ of prohibition to be granted. Again, which emphasizes the rigidity of the common law writ of prohibition. Because if any of these is absent, the writ of prohibition cannot be granted or will not be granted by a court. So the first is that uh, it will only be granted if the decision uh, involves an exercise of legal authority that is a public power. Which means, therefore, uh, as we will see, the writ of prohibition cannot be granted uh, against a decision, uh, for example, uh, by a private agency that to, to, to which the government may have entered into an arrangement. So for example, um, a, there might be a private agency uh, that is privatized by the government or that is um, to which uh, certain functions have been delegated by the government, for example, in terms of garbage collection, it could be telecommunications. But in that case, because they would be private agency agencies and they do not exercise legal authority, a writ of prohibition would not be granted against them. So it can only be, the writ of prohibition can only be granted if it involves an exercise of legal authority or a public power. Secondly, the, uh, it can only be uh, issued if a decision in question affects the right of a person. So as I pointed out earlier uh, in the case of Ainsworth, uh, where the, there, there, even if there might have been a, a report, for example, that was uh, prejudicial to the applicant, but because that report did not actually uh, affect, directly affect the decision of an administrative agency. It did not therefore affect the right of such an applicant. And therefore, uh, in the same manner that a writ of certiorari couldn't be issued, a writ of prohibition also couldn't be issued because it did not affect the right of a person. Thirdly, a, so in other words, in the case of Ainsworth versus Criminal Justice Commission, a preliminary decision uh, would not uh, impinge upon the rights of a person and therefore, uh, in that case, uh, the writ of prohibition would be unavailable. Thirdly, uh, the writ of prohibition would only be available if the decision maker must have a duty to act judicially. That is, uh, it must be a judicial or administrative decision maker. So if there is no requirement on the part of an administrative decision maker, for example, to act judicially, in other words, um, that there is a, a duty to act fairly or there is a duty to provide natural justice or procedural fairness to, to an applicant before it, then the writ of prohibition, again, would also not be available. So for example, if you speak in the context of a visa officer, a visa officer uh, may not be required to, uh, to observe the rules of natural justice uh, by statute mainly because uh, the understanding is that a person who applies for a visa does not actually have a right to a visa. And so in that case, uh, a writ of prohibition uh, will not be available for the purpose of restraining uh, such a decision maker from, um, from enforcing its order or decision. Fourthly, uh, the writ of prohibition 
can only be issued if a decision maker has committed a jurisdictional error. So therefore, an error of law will not be a sufficient ground for the issuance of a writ of prohibition. So in contrast to a, the issuance of a writ of certiorari where a writ of certiorari can be issued both on the ground of jurisdictional error as well as an error of law appearing on the face of the record. In the case of a writ of prohibition, it can only be issued when there has been a jurisdictional error uh, on the part of the decision maker. So how do we uh, compare and contrast prohibition uh, and certiorari? So both would operate to correct the same legal error, but they would operate at different times in the decision-making process. So prohibition generally corrects the legal error before it has been made or before action is taken under the decision. Certiorari, on the other hand, corrects the legal error after it has been made. So let's, let's have an example. So let's say there is a decision to deport a person where there is a legal error in the decision. Uh, in that case, therefore, and not only is there a legal error, but there is obviously a jurisdictional error in the decision. In that case, the effect of certiorari would be to quash the decision to deport. Pro prohibition, on the other hand, would, be, would have the effect of restraining the actual deportation of the person. Now, as, pointed out, as I pointed out as well, prohibition is only available for jurisdictional error, whereas certiorari is available both for jurisdictional errors and errors of law. As appearing on the face of the record. Now there is a uh, third common law remedy and that is the, uh, writ, the, the remedy of the writ of the issuance of a writ of mandamus which is a writ that is issued by a court to compel an officer or administrative body to command the fulfillment of some duty of a public nature which remains unperformed or to compel an officer to do an act which the applicant is entitled to have done and without the doing of which he cannot enforce or enjoy some right which he possesses. So an a writ of mandamus does not issue except to command the fulfillment of some duty of a public nature which remains unperformed. And so therefore for, for mandamus to issue the case must involve the non-fulfillment or, or performance of a public, public duty by an officer or administrative body. So therefore if a, an applicant cannot show that, uh, that, the, that an officer or administrative, bot or administrative body has uh, failed to perform or fulfill a public duty, then mandamus uh, will not be available. So mandamus, for example, will usually not be available when uh, the exercise of a power also involves an exercise of a discretion. Because in that case, because of the existence of discretion, it will be very difficult to argue that there is a, a duty on the part of an officer or administrative body to act in a certain way. So you can only speak of mandamus when the applicant can clearly show that uh, the, the public body or officer or administrative body actually has failed to fulfill or perform a public duty. And a writ of mandamus must show also that the ostensible determination is not a real performance of the duty imposed by law upon the tribunal. So not only can, uh, you, can, you, can you ask for a writ of mandamus when a, a, uh, an officer or administrative body fails to fulfill or perform a public duty, but also when even if it can be said that an officer or administrative body seems to have fulfilled a, or perform a, a public duty, but if th that exercise or the fulfillment or performance is not a real one, then in that case, the writ of mandamus would also be available. So when you say a, a, a real performance, it must be according to uh, what the law would expect. So even if, so if it is just an attempt to uh, perform a duty, but it is not actually according to, to the law, then in that case, uh, it cannot be said that there has actually been an actual fulfillment or performance of a public duty, and for which reason, the writ of mandamus may also be available. So the final uh, common law 
remedy that we would speak of would be uh, the writ of habeas corpus, which is the writ issued by a court that allows the lawfulness of the interference with or deprivation of a citizen's liberty to be examined and tested by a court. So the writ would direct a person who is responsible for detaining another to bring the body of the detainee to the court and to then do what the court directs. Uh, this typically uh, would happen in the case of, um, of instances when the police may arrest a person and uh, a writ of uh, habeas corpus may be sought from the court in order to ask the police officer to explain the legality of the detention. It can, and it, it often also has been uh, sought in the cases of, uh, uh, in, which involve uh, immigrants or in the case of both refugees. Um, the, the writ of habeas corpus has also been a popular judicial remedy that has been sought. But for habeas corpus to issue, there must be three requirements again that must be met. So again, we will notice requirements. There is a requirement. These are the requirements that must be met. So you will again notice the rigidity there. Again, you know, looking to see the connection with um, equitable remedies later on. So there are three requirements that must be met for habeas corpus to issue. First, there must be a detention that is attributable to the alleged detainer. Two, the detention must be unlawful. And three, the detainee must have a legal right to be released. So if any of these requirements are not met, because one, the detention might be lawful, because, for example, um, a, a court has uh, issued a warrant that uh, would enable a, a public officer to detain a person, then in that case, um, habeas corpus would no longer be available. Now, what exactly do we mean by curtailment of freedom? In the case of Minister for Immigration and Multi Multicultural Affairs versus Vadalis in the federal court, the relevant freedom is freedom of movement, which results in a person's freedom of movement being curtailed. So the view that a total restraint of movement is necessary to, con to constitute detention amenable to habeas corpus has been rejected. So there is no requirement that there is a total restraint of movement. It is sufficient that there seems to be restraint of movement uh, of a person. And that would already justify the issuance of a writ of habeas corpus. Now, we will examine this time, uh, so the spelling there is wrong, so that should be just one letter T. Uh, we'll examine this, why, this time equitable remedies, uh, in, in particular the equitable remedy of injunctions. So as we said, as I pointed out, the equitable remedies of the courts emerged as a way to uh, fashion, for the courts to fashion justice in an individual case, and in order to rectify the, in order to rectify the rigidity uh, of the requirements of common law courts before they would issue writs of uh, common law writs. Because remember, we spoke of requirements. So uh, equitable remedies um, uh, were, were meant to address the rigidity of the issuance of common law writs. So one of these uh, equitable remedies which, so in other words, it was issued by way of equity. So an injunction is an order or decree issued by a court in the exercise of its equitable jurisdiction that requires a party either to do a specific act, in that case, it's a mandatory injunction, or to refrain from or cease doing a specific act, in, that case, in which case it is a prohibitory injunction. Now, an, an injunction may be perpetual, that is, it is granted at the conclusion of the court proceedings or interlocutory or interim. That is, it is granted before or during the proceedings to prevent any change in the status quo until a final determination is made by the court. So you will notice already that as far as the injunction is concerned, especially the interlocutory or interim injunction, it is a rule that is issued by the court even prior to the issuance of a final order ruling by the court. Because the... the, the the purpose is uh, it, it um, seeks to uh, re restrain a, a, an inferior court or to restrain an administrative body from doing something even before 
a, a final determination is made by a superior court. Whereas, if you look at the remedies of certiorari or prohibition, for example, they, they, they would relate to uh, decisions uh, or orders uh, made by a court or uh, made by a court after a final determination has been done. So the inter interlocutory or interim uh, equitable uh, remedy of injunction, on the other hand, uh, can be granted before or during the proceedings to prevent any change in the status quo until a final determination is made by the court. Now, in uh, Castle, Maine, Tuhi's Limited versus South Australia, Chief Justice Mason said that for an interlocutory injunction to be uh, granted to the court, the plaintiff must show that there is a serious question to be tried or the, case, the plaintiff has made out a prima facie case in the sense that if the evidence remains as it is, there is a probability that at the, at the trial of the action, the plaintiff will be held entitled to relief. Second, that he will suffer irreparable injury for which damages will not be an adequate compensation unless an injunction is granted. And third, that the balance of convenience favors the granting of an injunction. So these uh, are requirements that must be met before uh, an interlocutory injunction must uh, can, can be granted by a court. Now, it is worth emphasizing as well that that in the same manner that uh, common law judicial writs are discretionary on the part of the, of the courts, the same is true as far as equitable remedies are concerned. Courts uh, do not have any uh, legal duty to issue any of these writs. They will only issue it if the, the writ of uh, in, uh, injunction, for example, if certain requirements are met. So in other words, it is highly discretionary on the part of the court to issue it or not, which again uh, makes it different, for example, from the statutory uh, remedies which might be available uh, under the Administrative Decisions Judiciary Judicial Review Act of 1977, because in that case, um, a, an applicant that, that, who can show that uh, he has ground to the, that he has a legal ground or a legal basis to, to the relief, um, will be entitled to a relief granted to be granted by the court. It no longer becomes discretionary on the part of the court, but it becomes a, uh, a legal duty on the part of the court to actually provide the remedy uh, grant uh, what that's available under the, uh, under the statute. The other equitable remedy, uh, again, um, just ignore the wrong spelling there. So the other equitable remedy is the remedy of declaration. So a declaration or a declaratory judgment or order is a court order that conclusively states or declares the pre-existing rights of the parties. It is, in other words, simply a court's declaration or statement resolving a dispute as to the meaning or application of the law applicable to a situation in which the applicant has sufficient interest. So a, a declaration, for example, does not really involve an order uh, on the part of the court that requires any of the parties to do a specific act. It does, however, in a sense, um, settle the, the matter between the parties because it resolves a dispute as to the meaning or application of the law applicable to a situation in, the, in, the, in which the applicant has a sufficient interest. And because there has already been, there might be said to be a declaration uh, by a court as to the rights of the parties, then especially in relation to an administrative agency, there is a good chance that the administrative agency will then act according to what has been declared by a court. So even though a declaration uh, is not binding in the sense that it compels another party or an administrative agency to act in a certain way, it becomes a highly persuasive order because it does uh, show whether or not a, an applicant or a party may have a, a certain right or interest in a, in a matter. So for example, uh, going back to the case of Green versus Daniels at the High Court, uh, although Justice uh, Stephens in the High Court 
do not uh, grant the the uh, the remedy that was sought, which was to order the decision maker to grant the benefits that had been sought. Uh, the uh, Justice Stephens, however, uh, issued a writ of declaration to state what the rights of the applicant actually were according to the law. Now, the only reason, well, the main reason, the reason why uh, Stephen, Justice Stephens did not uh, order the administrative decision maker to act in a particular way would be, if you think about it. I mean, assuming that a court uh, already has made a determination as to whether or not an applicant actually is entitled to a particular benefit or what his right, his or her rights might be, why then wouldn't a court uh, issue an order to the admissive decision maker to provide the benefits? Why couldn't the court do that? The reason for this, as we said, is that uh, judicial view is, uh, is of uh, limited scope and it does not go into the merits of a decision, and neither will judicial review attempt to substitute its decision for that of the decision maker. So even if a court may have made a declaration as to the rights or interests of a party litigant or an applicant, uh, a court will still leave it to the administrative decision maker to determine what the appropriate uh, uh, benefits might be that should be given to the uh, to the applicant because in the end it will the court cannot substitute its decision for that of the decision maker it will still be the decision maker that will still make the ultimate decision as to the rights or benefits of uh, a, a party litigant in Ainsworth versus criminal justice commission uh, the high court uh, sought to explain that when the remedy of declaration is available, and they said, uh, Chief Justice Mason, Justices Dawson, Tuhi, and Godron uh, emphasized that declaratory relief must be directed to the determination of legal controversies and not to answering abstract or hypothetical questions. The person seeking relief must have a real interest, and therefore relief will not be granted if the question is purely hypothetical if relief is claimed in relation to circumstances that have not occurred and might never happen, or if the court's declaration will produce no foreseeable, foreseeable consequences for the parties. So in other words, if a declaration will not lead to anything, then the court will refrain from issuing a declaration. So we've already covered uh, common law judicial review remedies. And we noted that uh, common law judicial review remedies are discretionary in the part of the courts, but more importantly, they're discretionary in the sense that before they can be issued by a court, there are certain rigid requirements that an applicant must meet so that if an applicant um, is not able to establish uh, those jurisdictional requirements, then uh, the, judicial, the common law judicial review remedies will not be granted by a court. And we will remember that among them was that uh, a common law judicial review remedy would only be available, for example, if uh, it would involve a decision, decision or order uh, that is made by either in an inferior court or uh, an administrative body that is acting judicially. So in other words, there is a requirement that um, a, a, an agency, for example, must accord an applicant, uh, the, the principles of natural justice or procedural fairness. And it wouldn't apply, therefore, to the exercise of a power by a private agency to which uh, the government may have um, delegated uh, certain functions and powers. And equitable remedies, as we noted, uh, would be a way by which courts are able to fashion certain remedies that would meet the uh, particular needs of justice in a specific case. And it also would enable the courts uh, to overcome the rigidity of uh, the requirements of the issue before a common law writ can be issued with the court. So that even if certain uh, requirements 
uh, may not be present, it would then be possible for a, a court uh, to actually issue uh, certain of these uh, equitable remedies. And whereas historically, um, the court, the common law courts that issued the common law writs were distinct from the, uh, the courts of chancery, the courts of equity that then belonged to the king, um, there was a unification in the UK of uh, courts, of uh, the common law courts and the courts of equity, so that in the UK, as, in, as well as in Australia, a court is both a common law court as well as a court of equity. So a, a court in Australia uh, can issue both uh, the common law writs as well as the equitable writs. Now, let's speak of statutory remedy. So again, when you speak of common law writs and equitable writs, these are writs that were developed by the courts. Statutory remedies, on the other hand, are remedies that were developed or promulgated by the Commonwealth Parliament. So therefore, because they were developed by the Parliament, it is also uh, within the power of the Parliament either to vary those remedies which they have um, promulgated under statute, or they even have the power to repeal the law, which would provide for those statutory remedies. Again, to point out that you know, the distinction in relation to common law writs and equitable writs, it, the courts are unlikely to allow the, uh, the, uh, the Commonwealth Parliament, for example, to say that the court does not have the power to, um, to exercise certain of those powers. That, that can amount to what is known as an ouster clause. And uh, the courts have, have consistently ruled that it is not within the power of the, uh, of the Commonwealth Parliament to deprive it of its inherent powers to uh, provide uh, judicial remedies in the proper case. So statutory remedies, on the other hand, because they are creations of the Commonwealth Parliament or by statute, it is, the it is within the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to either vary the statute or to repeal it altogether. And um, there are at least two statutes uh, that provide statutory remedies. One is the Judiciary Act of 1903 Commonwealth under Section 39B, as well as the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 Commonwealth. Now, there is a, uh, another uh, source of judicial remedy, and, but this time it is a constitutional writ, and that is based on Section 75, so Paragraph 5 of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution. So this is considered a constitutional writ, and therefore not within the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to change or to control. So the, the, the Commonwealth Parliament would not have the power, for example, to, to deprive the High Court uh, of its original jurisdiction to issue writs of endowments, prohibition, or injunction against officers of the Commonwealth because the power of the High Court, the power of the, the original jurisdiction of the High Court to issue such writs is based on the Constitution. And so therefore, uh, uh, it is beyond the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to uh, oust the court, for example, from exercising its original jurisdiction under that specific provision of the Australian Con Commonwealth Constitution. So, uh, under Section 39 of the Judiciary Act of 1903 Commonwealth, the federal, the original jurisdiction of the Federal Court of, this, of Australia includes jurisdiction with respect to any matter in which a writ of mandamus or prohibition or an injunction is sought against an officer or officers of the Commonwealth. You will notice that uh, the similarity, similarity uh, of, of that power that is available to the federal court uh, with, the, with the power of the High Court under Section 75, Paragraph 5 of the Australian Com Commonwealth Constitution, which relates to the original jurisdiction of the High Court, uh, which provides that in all matters in which a writ of mandamus or prohibition or an injunction is sought against an officer of the Commonwealth, the High Court shall have original jurisdiction. And so in the case of Re Refugee Review, Review Tribunal, ex parte ELA, the High Court stated that the concept of constitutional writ is preferable to a prerogative writ in describing the High Court's jurisdiction to issue the writs of mandamus, prohibition, or injunction. Uh, this is a crucial point, as we said, because uh, historically, if you speak of the writs of mandamus, prohibition, or injunction, 
these are prerogative writs of the courts. So remember, uh, we spoke earlier of the common law writ of mandamus or prohibition, as well as the equitable writ of injunction. These are prerogative writs. But uh, the High Court emphasized that, there is, that the, the, constitu the constitutional nature of the writ that it can issue uh, under Section 75.5 of the Australian Co Commonwealth Constitution so that it would be preferable to call them constitutional writs as opposed to prerogative writs. So if you distinguish uh, the provisions of Section 75.5 of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution and that of Section 13B of the Judiciary Act of 1903, you will notice a similarity uh, of both provisions. And the main distinction is that um, Section 75.5 relates to the original jurisdiction of the High Court, whereas Section 13B of the Judiciary Act 1903 re relates to the original jurisdiction of the Federal Court of Australia. Now, apart from the Section 39B of the Judiciary Act of 1903, Commonwealth, the other uh, statutory basis for statutory remedies would be the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977, Commonwealth. Again, a, an, an enactment of the Parliament, which under Section 16.1 provides that on an application for an order of review in respect of a decision, the federal court or the federal circuit court may, in its discretion, make all or any of the following orders. So one, it can order the quashing or setting aside of the decision or part of the decision with effect from the date of the order or from such earlier or later date as the court specifies. Uh, it can also issue an order referring the matter to which the decision relates to the person who made the decision for further consideration subject to such directions as the court thinks fit. Thinks fit. Thirdly, it can order, uh, it can issue an order declaring the rights of the parties in respect of any matter to which the decision relates. And finally, it can issue an order directing any of the parties to do or to refrain from doing any act or thing, the doing or the refraining from do with the doing of which the court considers necessary to do justice between the parties. Now, you will notice that uh, these specific powers are actually similar to the common law and equitable writs that we initially discussed. So, where was that? So, for example, um, uh, Section 161A would actually be equivalent to the writ of certiorari. So, an order quashing or setting aside the decision or part of the decision would actually amount to the issue to a writ of certiorari. An order declaring the rights of parties in respect of any matter to which the decision relates would amount to a writ of declaration. And an order directing any of the parties to do or to refrain from doing any act or thing, the doing or the refraining from the doing of which the court considers necessary to do justice between the parties would also amount to a writ of prohibition or a writ of injunction. And, and we're, we're going to discuss again why the High Court at some point, and the Federal Court pointed out that um, notwithstanding the enactment of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 Commonwealth, the courts continue to retain their powers to issue uh, the common writs of uh, prohibition and bandamos and habeas corpus, as well as the equitable remedies uh, of, uh, of, of injunction, for example. So, why was, let's go back to the uh, Administrative Decision Judicial, the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977. So the purpose of the ADJ Act was mainly to reform and simplify the procedures and requirements for the awards of judicial, for the award of judicial review. It also sought to codify the grounds of judicial review, but it did not affect the application of common law judicial review. And so therefore the two schemes coexist. Uh, it, it bears noting, however, that as, as, we, already know, as we already know by now, uh, recourse under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act is available only when uh, an administrative decision is based on an enactment. So that if a decision is not based on an enactment, such as, for example, because the decision 
uh, so it was based on a general law, such as the general law of contracts, or because um, it wasn't an, an, an enactment as well, uh, because let's say it involved the exercise of a prerogative power. So remember, we talked about the power of the executive to enter into treaties, to declare war, or to control its borders. Uh, these involve prerogative powers in the sense that um, uh, the executive can exercise these powers in, even in the absence of an authorizing power coming from the Commonwealth Parliament. So in other words, even in the absence of a statutory enactment coming from the Commonwealth Parliament, or even in the absence of a statutory authorization coming from the Commonwealth Parliament, um, the executive has the power and the prerogative to, to do these things, including the power to enter into contracts. So if, for example, a, an administrative decision is made by the executive, even if it affects, impinges, or interferes with the rights of an individual, if that decision is not founded on an enactment or was not based on an enactment, then we know that um, recourse under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 is not available. So in that case, we need to remember or we need to determine if it would still be possible, therefore, for recourse to be had to the courts under, its, uh, under common law judicial review. Or for that matter, under... Uh, whether or not uh, it is permissible to go to the federal court on the basis of Section 39B of the Judiciary Act of 1903 Common Law, where, as we know, the Federal Court of Australia has the power to issue writs of mandamus, prohibition, or injunction against uh, an officer or officers of the Commonwealth. And of course, under Section 75.5 of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, the High Court also has original jurisdiction to issue writs of mandamus, prohibition, and injunction against officers of the Commonwealth. So assuming that the ADGR Act uh, cannot be availed of because the administrative decision did not, uh, was not made on the basis of an enactment, we must remember that judicial uh, review might still be available on the basis of uh, uh, the common law judicial review, which always involved an assertion on the part of the courts that it had the power to control uh, actions of the executive where they uh, unlawfully um, interfered with the rights and freedoms of individuals, or uh, it could it, it could then be uh, there could then be judicial review on the basis of the Judicial Act of 1903 or Section 75.5 of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution. So, in Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs versus Coningham, the full federal court pointed out that although the ADJRA did not take away existing remedies, it was plainly designed to provide a more streamlined procedure for the obtaining of relief which was formerly available only by way of prerogative writ or declaration of right. It would therefore seem unlikely to have been the intention of Parliament not to clothe this court with powers at least as extensive as courts of common law should exercise. So in other words, um, the full federal court pointed out that even when a court uh, has before it an application for judicial review, the, the remedies that such a court uh, can, can grant is unlimited to that which is provided under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act, but such a court still has the power to issue writs that are available both under the common law as well as the equitable writs. And this view of a broad application of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act was affirmed in Park O. Ho versus Minister for State of Minister of State for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs. So we discussed that already. Now, um, it is also worth emphasizing that uh, in relation, for example, to Section 16, subparagraph 1 of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act, there is a the court is empowered to order, uh, to issue an order directing any of the parties to do or to refrain from doing any act or thing, the doing or the refraining from the doing of which the court considers necessary to do justice between the parties. So the relevant question here is, would it be permissible for the, uh, for the court on the basis of this enactment to uh, direct the administrative decision maker, for example, to act in a certain way so that, for example, it will order a, an administrative decision maker to, to grant benefits where the decision maker felt that uh, the granting of benefits uh, was not the appropriate uh, course of action to make? The answer is no. Um, 
because in the case of Green versus Daniels, uh, the high court uh, through just, Justice Stevens pointed out that although uh, it was, the plaintiff, for example, was entitled to the declarations of the general nature already indicated, it was not within the power of the court to order the, uh, the uh, administrative decision maker to, to pay uh, any, of the, uh, any of the benefits or the so-called entitlements because the reason why the court, as you pointed out, cannot issue this order is because, because, is because that, uh, the remedy, because the, the uh, judicial review is of limited scope and if a court exercises the power of judicial review, it is never in, it never has the power to substitute its own decision for that of the decision maker. It will always be the decision maker that makes the ultimate decision. So, whereas a court, for example, may remit a matter to the to the decision maker uh, to re-examine its decision, it can do that, but it cannot order uh, the decision maker, for example, to. Uh, to pay benefits because in that case that would involve a substitution of the decision of the decision maker and already involve a, uh, an, a review of the merits of a decision, which courts are powerless to do. So after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the distinction between common law prerogative judicial review remedies and equitable judicial review remedies, the specific common law prerogative Judicial review, uh, judicial remedies of certiorari, mandamus, revision, and habeas corpus, as well as the specific equitable judicial remedies of declaration and injunction, and the statutory judicial review remedies.